Um, this has been an amazing lecture series, so I'm really excited to be part of it. And in the spirit of Dazzle, I'm going to start about telling you where I'm from. And the question, where are you from, is often seen as a really loaded question for many people of color. Um, it's often followed by the question, where are you really from, as sometimes people don't believe us if we say we're from America or from California. So today I'm going to tell you the story about where I am really from. Um, I was born in Shandong, China. Here's a picture of me and my parents in front of their university. When I was one and a half years old, we moved to the United States to Tulsa, Oklahoma um, for my dad to go to graduate school. And then next we moved to Orange County. And then after that, we moved to the Bay Area. Here's a picture of me and my family now with my younger brother, who's six years younger than me. And then after that, we moved to Houston, Texas. And then my dad's job took us overseas to Lagos, Nigeria, which is where I went to an international school for my middle school years. And then after that, we moved to Jakarta, Indonesia, which is where I went to high school. Then after high school, I came back to the US, to Southern California, and I went to Pomona College for my undergrad. And like many children of immigrants, I initially thought I wanted to be a doctor, but then I fell in love with research when I started working in the lab. And so my sights shifted to graduate school. Um, and then to be really sure I wanted to go to graduate school, I did a two-year postbac at the National Institutes of Health, and I worked in a neuroscience lab there to gain more research experience. Before finally coming back to Southern California um, for my PhD here at UCSD. So I tell you all this because one, it is important to understand my full background, and also to highlight that I have had um, an extraordinary amount of privilege I've had access to good schools, even while I was living abroad. Um, and I've had parents that were able to invest in my education. Um, also, I just want to say that moving around, while moving around, I've had to constantly define and redefine my identity as an Asian American. And especially over the past six months, I've been doing a lot of reflecting about what it means to be Asian American. So I'm going to share with you all some of what I've been thinking and learning about. And this centers on the idea of the model minority myth. So um, most of you are probably familiar with this idea, even if you don't know the term. And this is the idea that Asian Americans are successful because they're hardworking and follow the rules. Um, and they keep their head down and they don't complain. So the idea following this is that if Asian Americans can quote unquote, lift themselves up by their bootstraps, why can't other minorities? And the model minority myth is harmful for a few different ways. Um, first of all, it ignores the diversity and the range of experiences within the Asian American community. So for example, data from 2016 shows that Asians in the top 10% um, earn almost 11 times as much as Asian Americans in the bottom 10% of the income bracket. So they're the demographic with the largest income gap. And so while we often think of immigrants that come here from Asia for education and school, we often tend to overlook immigrants that come to America to flee war or poverty in their home nations. And two, the model minority myth is harmful because it pits minorities against each other. Um, the idea being that if Asians are successful because we work hard, then other minorities must not be trying hard enough. And an example of this is the 1992 LA riots, which were due to many different reasons, but one reason was the tension between the Black American community and the Korean American community. And this resulted in the burning down of Chinatown. And I just also wanna say that the comparison between minorities isn't fair because you can't equate the racism that Asians face with the racism and systemic barriers that are faced by other minorities. Um, and lastly, the model minority myth is harmful because it is conditional and it can be taken away. So Asian Americans weren't always seen as these outstanding citizens. In fact, the first anti-immigration law was passed in 1882. Um, this was the Chinese Exclusion Act, which was passed to prevent people from immigrating from China, as well as to prevent Chinese people in the United States from obtaining citizenship. And this is because people in the States at that time thought that Chinese people were dirty and diseased and immoral, which might sound familiar to what's happening today. 
Um, in the 1940s, after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, thousands of Japanese Americans were interned in these internment camps, um, regardless of how long their family had been in the United States. So this was purely based on their ethnic heritage. And this picture is from a camp in Manzanar, which is in the Eastern Sierras in California, um, just a five hour drive away from us. And I visited this camp last year and it was really eye opening. It's a national historic site, so it's really well preserved. So if any of you, any of you are ever out there, I highly recommend going. And in today's climate, Asians have faced huge increases in anti-Asian hate crimes due to certain people calling um, COVID-19 the Chinese virus. Um, and in fact, there've been over 2000 reports of anti-immigration, anti-Asian discrimination filed since the onset of the pandemic. And of these 2,000, over 1,000 of these were filed within California. Um, so while we like to think of ourselves as a diverse and progressive state, um, that doesn't mean that acts of racism can't occur here. So I've been reflecting a lot about how the model minority myth has affected me. And one of these ways is that it's made me think that I'm not entitled to speak on race and social justice because I should be keeping my head down and not complaining. So this is something that I have been unlearning. Um, and one way I'm unlearning this is by learning about the history of Asians in America. And so here are some resources that I use and I can send these out um, or put them in the chat for anyone who's interested. And I wanna highlight the first link, which is a five part documentary series produced by PBS that just came out this year. And it's a really good overview of the history of Asians in America. And the takeaway that I want from this first part of my talk is that Asian Americans are not a monolith and we should celebrate the diversity within our community. And what I would really like to see is for more Asian people, especially Asian American scientists, to speak up and speak out and speak to each other about how race has affected them. And maybe this is already happening and I just don't know about it. So if you want to chat more, please reach out to me. Okay, now we're going to pivot and talk about opioids, which is what I study. And when you think about opioids, you probably think about the opioid epidemic, um, which has been ramp rampant in this country. And especially now in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, there have actually been a huge number of increases in the number of overdose deaths reported. There's a 40% increase in deaths um, this past May as compared to May of last year. So this is very much still a problem. Um, and perhaps this isn't surprising because the COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated other underlying health issues and mental health issues as well. So the research that I do is a few steps removed from solving the opioid crisis anytime soon, but it's still really important in understanding how opioids work. So I'm interested in the basic mechanisms of opioid receptors. In particular, these two receptors called the mu opioid receptor and the delta opioid receptor. These are both GIO coupled receptors. So this means they are inhibitory generally to the cell that they're present on. And these two receptors bind their natural ligand enkephalin. So enkephalin is a neuropeptide and it's naturally released by your body. And when it's released, it will bind both mu and delta opioid receptors. And these two receptors have various behavioral outcomes. So they both lead to analgesia, which is why opioids are prescribed as painkillers. The mu opioid receptor, which binds morphine, also leads to reward, and that's why opioids are addictive. And the delta opioid receptor leads to decreases in anxiety. And oftentimes, um, these two receptors can be found in the same brain area or maybe even the same cell. So one of my underlying questions is if mu and delta opioid receptors use the same mechanism to carry out their effects. And the mechanisms for opioid receptors have been relatively well fleshed out at the level of the cell body. Um, so neurons are composed of a cell body, axon, and dendrites. And at the level of the cell body, people have shown that opioid receptors, because they are GIO coupled receptors, lead to decreases in cyclic AMP and PKA signaling. People have also shown that opioid receptors will lead to the opening of these inward rectifying potassium channels, and this causes the neuron to become less excitable. 
What is not known is what mechanisms opioid receptors use for signaling at the presynaptic terminal. So I have two candidate mechanisms that shown here, and I'll talk about these at more depth um, in a coming slide. So the underlying question of my talk is what signaling pathways mediate presynaptic opioid receptors? And to answer this, I'm going to ask about the relative potencies of enkephalin, the natural ligand, on mu and delta opioid receptors. I'm going to ask with what kinetics do mu and, opioid, um, mu and delta opioid receptors suppress neurotransmission? Um, and also what beta gamma mechanisms determine potency and kinetics of mu and delta opioid receptors? Also to answer these questions, I'm going to be taking advantage of these novel tools that are coming out of our lab. So this is a caged um, opioid. It's a caged enkephalin, which is an enkephalin that has a caging group attached to it so that when it's in its caged form, it's inactive. And you can just apply this to your brain slice or inject it into an animal. Um, after shining a UV LED or a UV laser, the caging group comes off and it leaves you with the active form of enkephalin in the bath, which is then for you to interact with um, mu and delta opioid receptors. And the system that I'm studying opioids in is in the hippocampus, which um, many people think of as a learning and memory center. Um, we chose to study opioids in the hippocampus because it's one of the first areas where opioid signaling was um, characterized. So we know that opioids are present on these cells called parvalbumin basket cells or PV cells. Um, and these are inhibitory interneurons and they project onto the synapse, they synapse onto the cell body of parambyl cells, which are the main excitatory cells of the hippocampus. So here's an image showing its dense axon arbors in the parambyl cell layer. And the basic way that this neural circuit works is that the PV cell will fire an action potential, and this causes release of GABA, which is an inhibitory neurotransmitter, and that goes on to suppress spiking from the parambyl cell. So opioids, because they're present on this PV basket cell, will inhibit the release of GABA, which will disinhibit the pyramidal cell. And my general experimental setup is that I patch onto these pyramidal cells with the glass electrode um, in brain slices, and I stimulate these PV basket cell axons with another glass electrode. And when I do this, I can measure these inhibitory currents, which are basically a proxy for synaptic transmission. And now I'm stimulating every 20 seconds and I'm plotting the peak of these inhibitory currents every 20 seconds. And two seconds before my next stimulus, I apply UV laser. And this causes uncaging of the caged enkephalin. And this leads to a huge suppression of these currents. So by about 70%. And as the peptide clears, um, these recurrents recover back to baseline over the course of one to two minutes. So I'm getting the 70% suppression with one uncaging flash. Now what I'm plotting is multiple uncaging flashes in a row. So this is over 12 different uncaging events. And you'll see that with each event, the amount of suppression remains pretty steady. It stays at about 70% um, across 12 different light flashes. And I told you before that enkephalin acts on both mu and delta opioid receptors. So to ask um, what's responsible, which opioid re receptors are responsible, I first applied CTOP, which is an antagonist for the mu opioid receptor. And I found that this decreased the effect seen by the opioid by about half. So the opioid was less effective um, in the presence of this mu antagonist. And then I add on Tipsy, which is an antagonist for the delta opioid receptor, and I found that this completely blocked the opioid effect. The same thing happens when I add these two drugs in reverse, and the summary data are shown here. So what this is telling me is that both mu and delta opioid receptors are responsible for this enkephalin-induced suppression at the synapse. So to ask about the relative potencies of enkephalin, I use different intensities of UV laser flash. So this is with a 40 milliwatt laser. You can see the large suppression of these currents. With a 13 milliwatt laser, you also see a suppression, but to a smaller degree. And then as the laser light intensity decreases, the amount of suppression that I see also decreases. And I plotted the fraction suppression that I was getting against the laser power to generate a dose response curve. And I also did this in the presence of my antagonist, Tipsy, to isolate the mu opioid receptor and CTOP to isolate the delta opioid receptor. So to keep this simple, from now on for the rest of my talk, I'm just going to call um, 
the blue traces, the neopiate receptor, and I'll refer to the red as the delta opiate receptor. So now on this plot here on the right, I am plotting the dose response normalized to the maximal amount of suppression and on the log scale. And you can see here that the delta opiate receptor is pretty much indistinguishable from um, the black line, which is both of the receptors without any antagonists. Whereas the mu opiate receptor in blue is shifted to the right. So um, it takes more laser power to reach the same level of suppression um, with the mu opiate receptor. So this means that enkephalin is more potent at the delta opiate receptor than at the mu opiate receptor. So to answer 1A, enkephalin is more potent at delta than at mu. Next, to ask about receptor kinetics, I did a similar experiment to before, but now instead of giving two pulses of electrical stimulus, I am stimulating these cells with a high frequency train. So in this example, this is a 10 hertz train um, for five seconds. And in the middle of this train, I use the UV laser to uncage enkephalin, and you'll see the immediate suppression of these currents. I did this in the presence of CTOP and in TIPSI to isolate my mu and delta opioid receptors. And then I fit the suppression to an exponential function in order to extract the time constant of decay. And now what I'm plotting is the time constant of decay um, for three different frequencies, for 10 hertz, 20 hertz, and 50 hertz. And you'll see that regardless of which frequency, the mu opioid receptor in blue has a time constant that's almost twice as large as that of the delta opioid receptor shown here in red. And that's also illustrated in this plot, which is plotting the fraction suppression during that five second um, stimulus train. And you'll see that the mu opioid receptor takes longer to reach its peak than the delta opioid receptor. So from this, I'm concluding that the delta opioid receptor suppresses synaptic transmission faster than the mu opioid receptor. So to answer 1B, um, the delta opioid receptor acts faster than the mu opioid receptor. So next, I'm going to ask which of these G beta gamma pathways do opioid receptors use to suppress synaptic transmission? So these are two candidate pathways that other labs have shown to work for other GIO coupled receptors at the level of the axon. And what generally happens here is that the axon potential will invade this presynaptic terminal. This causes these voltage-gated calcium channels to open and calcium to flood into these cells. And the calcium mobilizes these snare proteins, which are associated with the vesicle, and that leads to vesicle fusion. So beta gamma has been shown to block voltage-gated calcium channels to prevent calcium influx. And it's also been shown to directly block snare proteins to inhibit the vesicle release machinery that way. And to ask if these opioid receptors are blocking calcium channels, I did two photon calcium imaging um, by patching onto these PV basket cells and filling them with a green calcium indicator and a red fluorescent dye. So by doing this, I can locate these axon boutons, which are my presynaptic terminals. And I did line scans across these boutons while evoking action potentials at the cell body. So here are the responses, the calcium transients, in response to one action potential, shown here in black. And in blue is the response in the presence of a mu agonist. And red is the response in the presence of a delta agonist. And in purple is having both agonists in the bath at the same time. And you'll see that um, in both conditions, having one agonist present in the bath decreases these transients by about 30%. Whereas having both agonists present in the bath decreases the transients by about 40%. So both mu and delta opioid receptors inhibit calcium influx through voltage-gated calcium channels. Next, to ask if they could be acting by inhibiting snare proteins, um, we got these mice from Heidi Ham's lab at Vanderbilt, and they discovered that the beta gamma subunit binds to the C terminus of a snare protein called SNAP25. And by binding to that, it can inhibit vesicle release. So they generated a mouse that has a truncated C terminus so that presumably this interaction can no longer happen. So I repeated my experiment in these mice and I found at first that yes, opioid suppression was still intact in these SNAP25 knockout animals. However, um, when I looked deeper, I found that the delta opioid receptor was less potent in these mice. So now I'm doing the dose response curve again with the different laser intensities in the presence of my two selective antagonists. And I found that the delta opioid receptor shown here in red had shifted to the right 
um, and now it matches the mu opiate receptor. So for reference, here is the plot I showed you before where the mu is shifted to the right. In these knockout animals, I found that delta was also shifted to the right. So somehow um, the delta opioid receptor signaling is compromised in these animals. I also found shifts in the kinetics of the delta opioid receptor. So here is the high frequency stimulus train experiment that I repeated in the knockout mice and in their wild type siblings. And I found that the time constant of decay for the delta opioid receptor was increased at 10 hertz and at 50 hertz. So again, this is showing compromised signaling of the delta opioid receptor. And that leads me to modify my initial model that I showed you before. And now what I think is happening is that the mu opioid receptor is acting primarily through these voltage-gated calcium channels, whereas the delta opioid receptor is able to act through both voltage-gated calcium channels and through snare proteins. And it's the ability to act to, through these multiple effectors that explains why delta is both faster and more potent than the mu opioid receptor. So to answer my last question, I think it's the ability to act through two different effectors that explains why delta is faster and more potent than the mu opioid receptor. So to tie that back to the beginning, um, the reason why this is important is because we still don't really understand how endogenous opioid signaling works. Um, and my data would suggest that the natural ligand enkephalin might be preferentially targeting the delta opioid receptor um, first over the mu opioid receptor. And so it is important for us to understand these endogenous systems before we can look at how these systems are affected in states like addiction. Okay, so with that, I would like to thank my lab and thank my mentor, Matt Banghart, as well as my committee members and my collaborators. Um, and I also want to thank my partner, Damon. This is a picture of us on our latest adventure. And I also want to mention that I'm really interested in diversity and representation in outdoor recreation. So Asian Bouldering Crew is actually an Instagram that Damon and I started to showcase Asian Americans in rock climbing. Um, and there are also plenty of other great organizations out there doing really good work in outdoor spaces. So if any of you are interested in that, I am happy to also talk more about that. All right, thank you and I'll take questions. <laughs>